Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. They ask you about the hour and when it shall cast anchor. But what have you to do with marking it? Its closure is up to your Lord. You are merely one who warns those who fear it. It is as though the day they witness it, they had lasted on earth a mere night or its morning. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. Welcome, Cosmic Adventurers, to Season 2, Part 6 of Allah and the Cosmos, where we will continue our amazing journey. We are still thirsty for more knowledge. Not only do we want to know where we are going, but we also want to know where we came from. Our story is written in starlight. Somewhere out there is the low tree. Beyond it lies the mother book. It is all just a distant memory. We all met once, you, me. We were all there together before we were transported here, Earth. The astonishing thing is, some of us, as in humans, are still there, waiting to come here to this planet, a tiny blue speck, lost, travelling across the multiverse. Within the last hour of the sixth day of creation, where are we headed? We are headed towards the last day, where our story ends, only to begin again but this time for all eternity. However, there are four human beings that Allah created. The way their souls were sent to earth was slightly different from the rest of mankind. The first man, Adam, he was created and sent to earth along with the first woman, Eve, who was also not born of our mother's womb. She was also sent to Earth as a grown adult. Then, of course, we have the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, who was raised up and will be sent to Earth again to defend us from a certain evil individual. And this evil individual, his birth, is also an exception from the rule. We know him as the Dajjal. He is the fourth human we spoke of, who will also have a slightly different birth, a birth that will take place after his own death. Now this may seem strange, and of course it is strange. How can the Dajjal be born after he dies? Now we strongly advise that if you haven't watched any of our previous videos, please start from the beginning of season one, part one creation in six days all the way up to the episode about the lost island of Dajjal season 2 part 5 all this episode may be too complicated to grasp before we dive deep into the topic of this episode let's take a moment to address a few mind-bending questions we've all thought about from the previous episode the lost island of Dajjal the birth of the Dajjal. What a strange scenario. How the Dajjal is born and then he travels back in time using future end times technology and then he gets stuck on an island and he emerges in his past, which is our future from the present moment in time. Okay, let's try not to lose sleep over this, although it's probably impossible. It seems like that the Dajjal will emerge and then he will die and then he will be born again and then he travels back in time to get stuck on the island and then emerge again. Where will it end? There's a loop in the timeline? Okay, okay, hold up. First of all, there is no loop that the Dajjal is born once and he dies once, just like everyone else. It's just the other way around in the timeline. Let us try to explain, inshallah. Let's take our whole timeline, which is from the beginning of everything to the end of everything. 
The beginning was actually when the throne was created. The throne was the first creation of Allah, when time began. Because as something that had a beginning, time starts for that object. The first object was the throne. And yes, it was also the pen. Why? How can that be? Well, the pen is a different type of creation. The throne is the actual creation that was made, and time began because the throne began to age, of course. The pen was deliberately made to record everything, so it's not the same type of creation as the rest. The pen, in a way, if you think about it, marks the beginning of time. The pen writes down everything that has happened, is happening, and will happen in a book, which we call Allah al Mahfuz, the preserved tablet, which is why we call it the cosmic timeline. This book is our timeline, everything is written in it. And what was the first thing do you think that the pen wrote? If we had to guess, if the pen was instructed to write everything. Of course, the first page would be about the creation of the throne of Allah, so the beginning of time, which we call throne time, and thus the commencement of the timeline. Now, we know that the pen was created 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth, so that is where the timeline starts. And of course, if you think about it, this actually hints about the creation of the throne, it seems it was also created 50,000 years before the Big Bang. Is this 50,000 years in throne years? Only Allah knows. Allah doesn't give us that information. But Allah did give us the six days. And on day one, we have the Big Bang. And at the end of day six, we have the end of the world. Allah al Mahfuz is that cosmic timeline, so everything written in this book is the predestination we all talk about. Written not because we are all being controlled, we all have free will. Written in advance because Allah knows the future and what's going to happen, so Allah wrote it down and thus creating the timeline simultaneously in which we are living in. The present moment, or what we call our world line, that we are perceiving right now has already been witnessed by Allah. Our world line is when and where we are in time and space, right now and in every moment. It's all been written in a book. Because we would always have chosen with our free will what we have and will choose to do. Any changes made to the timeline, for example, let's say we are meant to get a B on a paper, but we pray to Allah and ask for an A and Allah changes our destiny from getting a B on a paper to an A. This change was always meant to happen because this change Allah already wrote into the timeline to begin with. Similarly, the Dajjal, if he didn't travel back in time from the end of the world during the last 10 major signs, the original timeline would seem that the Dajjal would die when the world ends, but he travels back in time to prevent that original death and ends up dying anyway at the hands of Isa salam, in the past. It seems that way. But don't you see? The book is finished from Allah's perspective. Allah al mahfuz is complete. Even though Allah makes changes, those changes were always going to be made. Even though the Prophet salam, during his night journey heard the pens writing, somewhere in the cosmos this mother book is complete. From our perspective, time is linear. Time itself isn't linear though. We are just observing time that way. Time is moving forward for us. But for Allah, time is not a thing that's just moving forward. He can see the end and the beginning simultaneously. Allah can access a snapshot in time whenever he wants. So this means that the original timeline was always the way things were supposed to be absolutely complete. The Jal would have never died in the end times. In the timeline he always emerged before he was born. In the timeline he was always born after he died. His soul enters earth only once and his soul leaves earth only once. Maybe to prevent any paradoxes being made Allah trapped the Dajjal on an island. An island 
where time goes slowly, where Tamimadari met the Dajjal. If time goes slowly on the island, why did Tamimadari, when he left the island, not come back way into the future? Why did everyone else outside the realm of the island not age significantly? Well, we are not told the exact difference in time on the island compared to the rest of the earth, we only know that time is going slowly on the island. That's all we know. If the Dajjal has been on the island since the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, so about 2,000 years, Tami Madari was only on the island for what seems like a very short while, maybe even less than an hour. All we know about is the encounter with the beast and the Dajjal on the island, which seems like it didn't take long at all Whereas the Dajjal, in island time, was probably on the island for several years. So it is possible that when Tamimadari left the island, time did move forward. But maybe just by hours, weeks or even months. Only Allah knows. It wouldn't have been that noticeable. After all, he was on sea. So calculating time may have been difficult to begin with anyway in those situations. It probably would have just felt like a glitch. Like when you fall asleep and you wake up not really knowing how many hours had passed by, but you don't really look into it that much and you just carry on with the day. It's a bit like the sleepers in the cave. They only noticed 300 years when by after they had left the cave. But for Tamimadari, clearly that much time didn't pass by or he would have probably noticed Tamimadari was allowed to leave the island, but the Dajjal, he isn't allowed to leave. Yet. The Dajjal thought that he would change the past, but in reality the Dajjal changes nothing. Because you can't change the past. There are no loops, no paradoxes. It's just a straight line. It's like the movie Interstellar. What happened in the past, even though it's from the future, it was already within the timeline to begin with. Whatever will happen, happened anyway. Think of Allah al-Mahfuz, the cosmic timeline, like a movie. The movie starts, let's take an individual's world line, Sarah. Sarah is born in the present where the movie is being played. Sarah lives a full, wonderful life. Sarah eventually dies. Her part in the movie ends. But does the movie stop? No, it will continue on until the movie is over. Near the end of the movie, the Dajjal makes his debut. He emerges from the island, wreaks havoc on Earth. Then he dies. The movie continues though, right? Then the next scene, the Dajjal is born and then he travels back in time. In this moment, does the movie itself rewind back automatically at this moment for everyone to re-watch and relive from the time he arrives in the past? Of course not. The movie from the time that the Jal travels back in time would still be playing forward. Watching the movie you would see that the Jal leave on a time travel machine where his part in the movie is over and then you would see the remaining major signs and finally you would witness the end of the world. Then the movie ends. That's the space-time continuum. It's moving forward. We will get confused and think there's a loop or a paradox if we look at the timeline from the Jal's perspective only. But that's not reality. Reality is from the perspective of where you can see the whole timeline. Well, why can't we just pause the movie? We don't have that power. We are only characters in this movie. Who is in charge of the remote control of the movie? Allah, and only Allah. He can go to whatever point in the movie he wishes. Past, present, future, doesn't matter. He is the creator of the movie. After the movie ends, Judgment Day commences. Day seven in throne time. But technically, day seven here becomes what? Day one again, in perspective. Why? Well, think about it. From our perspective now, the last day is day seven. But when the sixth day ends and the timeline is finished, from our perspective, when we are resurrected or born again, 
day seven would actually be day one, right? The timeline has ended and a new timeline begins. How do we know that the timeline has ended when day six ends? Well, what did Allah say to the pen? Write everything. Everything until when? Everything until the last day. The last day's judgment day. So the timeline ends. Allah wal mahfuz ends. As day six ends. When everything ends. And all that is left is the face of Allah. As the last page of Allah wal mahfuz ends. The first day of the new timeline begins. Judgment day begins. And everything Allah wants is recreated. We are very near the end of the timeline. And on judgment day, we will all receive our mini timelines. Hopefully in our right hand. Some people will receive their book, their timelines. And within it, they may have the 10 major signs within their timelines. We pray that doesn't happen within our lifetime, but it could be us or our children, maybe our children's children, who face the severe trials of the Dajjal. Maybe they are the ones who fight behind Isa a.s. Maybe they are the ones who will hide from the ancient civilization who will be unleashed near the end. This ancient civilization we know them as Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Gog and Magog. We've all heard about Gog and Magog. We've all probably had nightmares about them. But who are Gog and Magog and where are they? They sound like something out of a zombie apocalypse movie. Of course only Allah knows who and where they are exactly. But of course Allah wants us to discover things, to ponder over his signs. And there is wisdom in this, because when we begin to see Allah's signs, our hearts begin to feel awe, a deep, intense feeling of everything having a design, a purpose, an indescribable feeling of being created, an unmatched gratitude of existing in the present moment. So we ponder. Allah gives us clues about this ancient civilization and the one he calls Dulkarnain. You won't need three guesses to where the clues are. Inside a beautiful glimpse into the cosmic timeline, an extraordinary printout from the mother of the book, Allah al Mahfuz. We know this miraculous snapshot as the Holy Quran. Let's explore together. The Dajjal has emerged and died. Jesus, peace be upon him, is hiding in a cave along with all the believers that are left after the war of the Dajjal. Meanwhile, Dajjal's mother is probably somewhere on the planet, pregnant, hiding from the chaos. They are hiding from the third major sign, Gog and Magog. Currently, right now, they are all behind a wall built by Dulkarnain. How do we know this? The truth always lies inside the Book of God. Let's go to the Holy Quran and return to the chapter of the cave to see what delightful breadcrumbs Allah left for us this time. Allah says, they ask you about the two-horned Dulkarnain. Say, I shall recite to you some mention of him. We had established him firmly on earth and granted him a path to the knowledge of all things. So he followed a path. Dul Karnain. Many people think that he is Alexander the Great, but Alexander did not believe in the one true God. Now we don't know who Dul Karnain truly is, but the closest resemblance would be Cyrus the Great. King Cyrus was just. He had a lot of power and he was very intelligent and travelled the world building structures. So it's very likely that Cyrus the Great was Dulkarnain. But the identity of Dulkarnain is not really the topic of this episode. Because truly we have little to no evidence of who he was. The topic of this episode is where Dulkarnain travelled to and what he did, how and to who. 
People say that, let's leave the unseen to Allah. Stop thinking about the wall of Gog and Magog. Well, what about what Allah wants? Allah says, ponder over the verses of the Quran. Isn't Gog and Magog and the location of the wall and the one who built it in the Quran? So why not ponder? Even if we were to find this wall, no force on the planet can bring it down. Why not? With all our tech? Well, because Allah has already given us a glimpse into the future. Allah tells us how the wall will come down. Only by His will. When someone says, inshallah, the wall will come down directly by Allah, somehow maybe by some natural force. No matter what we do or not do, it's not going to change the course of the timeline because we have already done everything we will do inside the timeline. This reminds us of when people say, let's not explore space. There's so much on earth to explore already and we should just stay where we are and only worry about what we already have at home. But this isn't really our home now, is it? How can we not explore when we know that our true home is somewhere up there, beyond the stars? Be like a wayfinder, a traveller. So, let us discover together, Cosmic Explorers. Have you ever wondered how the wall of Gog and Magog will come down? Dulcarnain built an iron wall somewhere on Earth. We have no idea where, but we do have a theory. In fact, there are many theories about Gog and Magog floating around out there. Before we get to the best candidate, let's address a few other theories real quick. Let's get the most obvious ones out of the way. The theories where, unfortunately, we have not found any sufficient evidence at all. Gog and Magog are not the Chinese, and the wall is not the Great Wall of China. The Great Wall of China is awesome, yes, but firstly, it's not made of iron. And there's no need for a secondly. If the puzzle doesn't fit to start, we won't continue with it. We shouldn't waste time. Time is relative, yes, but it is also precious. And there's only so much of it in this world. So let us move on. Gog and Magog are not the Russians, and they have not been released. Where is Isa? Where is the Dajjal? Isa alayhi salam is told that Gog and Magog have been released. Go and hide. It's an authentic hadith. Can't ignore it. The Mahdi is told by Isa alayhi salam to continue the prayer so they are together. It's an authentic hadith. Can't ignore it. The Mahdi is told that the Dajjal has emerged. It's an authentic hadith. Can't ignore it. So the Mahdi is the last minor sign and the Dajjal is the first major sign. The Dajjal is listed as one of the ten major signs by the Prophet and the Mahdi is alive at that time. It's an authentic hadith. Can't ignore it. There is an order here. The Mahdi, the Dajjal, Isa alayhi salam, Gog and Magog. We can't ignore this either. And the last ten major signs will come so fast like beads falling off a necklace. If somehow the Dajjal is a metaphor, or Isa alayhi salam is hiding, or the Mahdi is a metaphor or something, where are the earthquakes? Everything is a metaphor? Sorry, we are after the truth. Even if it's not what we want to hear, even if it seems so ridiculous at first, if the puzzle piece fits the puzzle, we will take it as a viable theory. This puzzle piece does not fit. In fact, this theory is not in line with the Quran and the Ahadith, and this is not an option. Some say the Jews are drinking up Lake Tabaria. They do not fit the bill. They are not Gog and Magog. 
Gog and Magog are so many in number, 999 of them for every believer. That would make their population over 1 trillion, 998 billion individuals. I don't know about you, but for us, any theory suggesting that Gog and Magog have been released already is out. It reminds us of when people say that the sun rising from the west is a metaphor of the western world rising. This is just untrue, because the western world rising is not a world-stopping impossible repentance-repelling event. Or when people say that the television is the Dajjal. It just doesn't make sense as a cosmic major sign from Allah of the world coming to a literal end. So, on to the next theory. Gog and Magog are aliens, and Dulcarnane travelled to other planets. This is a really cool theory. After all, the series is called Allah and the Cosmos, so if we were to lean towards this direction, it would fit the series. But like we said, we are after the truth. The truth always has a lot of evidence. And when reading the chapter of the cave, and how Dulcarnane travelled from the west to the east, and that this means interstellar travel, because Dulcarnain has knowledge of everything, we just may be going a bit too far. It's not enough evidence to suggest that he travelled into outer space, not to mention the sun setting and rising plays a massive role in the story. So how can Dulcarnain witness sunrise or sunset on Earth, if he is not on Earth? And why does a tribe say Gog and Magog are working corruption on Earth, if they are not on Earth? Even Allah says, we establish Dulcarnain firmly on Earth. People say, but it's not Gog and Magog, it's actually Gog of Magog, as in Gog are the people and Magog is the place. But have we considered the source? The source is the Bible, where it says Gog of Magog. And in the unaltered Quran it says what? Gog and Magog. Which source should we take? We respect the Bible and we should because it has God's words inside it. But taking what it says in the Bible over the Quran? Taking the New Testament over the Last Testament, when the Last Testament came to confirm what has been said in the Old and New Testaments? We probably shouldn't be doing that if we are after the truth. The truth would be in the last book. Any mistakes made in the Old and New Testaments by mankind would be rectified by the last testament which is word for word written by the Creator himself. Every word. So yes, it would be really cool if Gog and Magog were aliens already sent here, or are coming in the future, or came through a portal. But again, where is this logic coming from? Where is the trail of evidence? From a source that hasn't been tampered with. And another obvious piece of evidence is from an authentic hadith, when the Prophet tells his companions that Allah will tell Adam on the Day of Judgment to take 999 of his children out of 1000, as in Adam's children, and select them for the fire. The companions got terrified of this and asked, well, how will any of us go to paradise? The odds are just terrifying. The Prophet told them not to worry, as there are 999 from the tribe of Gog and Magog for every believer. Well, this is obvious. Gog and Magog are earthlings like us. They are also children of Adam. Okay, so Dulcarnain didn't travel into interstellar space, but that doesn't mean Gog and Magog are not aliens. Maybe they came here from a distant planet and got trapped. Really? Let's face it, if an alien civilization were to come to Earth, do we really think an Earthling, no offense to Dulcarnain of course, Allah loves him, and so we love him, but he was still an Earthling, do we really think an Earthling can trap aliens who have come to us? Wouldn't that mean that they are more advanced and more intelligent than us? And have more tech? We are told that Gog and Magog are even more primitive than the primitive humans complaining about them. If they were aliens, let's face it, 
they're probably more advanced to travel through space and find Earth. So, sorry cosmic explorers, this theory is unfortunately out. Even though it would have been so cool. Speaking of cool, there is a theory that Gog and Magog are somewhere in the Arctic Circle. Why? Well, Allah mentions in the Quran that Dhul Karnain went to a place where there is no shade from the sun. In the Arctic Circle, the sun doesn't set for six months in the whole year. Now we are thinking. Now we are trying to connect the dots from actual Quranic verses. However, there is an obvious flaw. The sun doesn't set for six months, yes. But it also doesn't rise for six months, which means there would be plenty of shade for six months out of the year. We love the thought, but Allah says that there was no shade at all. And no, this doesn't mean that these people didn't have homes or were not clothed or the sun didn't set normally. It merely means that there was no natural shade when the sun is out in the sky. Natural shade, like trees or mountains, something that naturally casts a shadow. So even though this was great detective work, this theory is also out. Now we come to the most credible theory. Dulcarnain was the king wearing a helmet with two horns, and also the king who traveled from west to east on earth, as his name in Arabic suggests that he traveled to the ends of the earth. Let's go back to the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, Dulcarnain followed a path where he came to the setting of the sun, so people took this to mean the west of the earth, because the sun sets in the west where he found a tribe. Then Dulcarnain followed another path until he reached the rising of the sun. So people took this to mean the east of the earth because the sun rises in the east, a place where there was no shelter for the tribe that lived there. Then Dulcarnain moved on to the final and third tribe who lived near two towering mountains or barriers. And they complained to Dulcarnain that Gog and Magog come from this path and cause havoc. This tribe was very primitive and they couldn't speak properly, but they relayed their message to Dulcarnain and asked him to build a wall. Dulcarnain accepted and built a wall from iron and molten copper, and only asked the tribe for their manpower to build the wall. All in all, praising Allah, Dulcarnain was a righteous king. Thus, the mighty wall was complete, and Gog and Magog could neither go above it nor could they dig through it. Gog and Magog try to dig every day and when they can see the rays of the sun, one of them says to go back and start again tomorrow. Some people say that an angel tells them to go back, but there is no evidence for this. It's the leader of Gog and Magog, one of their own tells them to go back, which would indicate that they are not very intelligent as they should have just had night shifts to continue the dig, right? When they come back in the morning to dig, they find the hole complete and they have to start again. This will continue on until one of them says, Inshallah. And that following day, the wall will come down by the will of Allah and they will be released. Gog and Magog will emerge in such huge numbers and so fast that they will be seen on every mountain top and they will cause havoc on earth. They will believe that they have conquered the earth. Then they will shoot their arrows into the sky and Allah will cause their arrows to come down with blood on them. So Gog and Magog will believe that they had conquered the heavens. Finally, Allah sends a small worm in their necks and they all die at once. This is the most credible theory and makes a lot of sense and is in accordance with the Quran and Hadith. So this is it then. It must be all we know about Gog and Magog and where they are and how the wall was built. The explanation is logical and simple. Hold on one moment. There actually may be a simpler explanation than even this one. There is another theory. 
a theory that also directly takes us back to the Holy Quran. Let's carry on exploring, shall we? So, Gog and Magog are digging. The opening of the wall closes every night. We know iron can't do this under the laws of physics. Iron doesn't just get remade out of nothing, unless it goes through a very hot melting process. Or something else, like some other solid element stabilizes the iron so the hole is remade, and then the hole can close. And there are many people, most in fact believe that Gog and Magog are somewhere in the North Pole, somewhere very cold with mountains, because it says in the Holy Quran that Gog and Magog are trapped somewhere between two mountains or two barriers and are at the furthest place of the world, which makes sense why people would think that they are somewhere cold. And if the iron wall is somewhere very cold, then each night the wall could just freeze over and Gog and Magog would have to dig again the next morning. Makes sense. And if they were surrounded by glaciers, well, it would make sense why we can't find them, because we can't get there. There is so much of the earth that is still a mystery to us. But wait, we may be missing something here that's right in front of our faces. So let us take a look again at this extraordinary journey inside the most extraordinary book in the multiverse. The Quran seems to indicate that Gog and Magog are not somewhere cold, but somewhere warm. How so? We will show you that in a moment. So they'll keep digging until one day one of them says, Insha'Allah. Then that would be the day that they will be allowed to emerge. People will still be doing Hajj around that time, our Prophet said. So it is believed that Gog and Magog will emerge sooner rather than later. Dhulkarnain, before this great king comes to the land of Gog and Magog, he says that he saw the sun setting in murky water. Now a lot of unbelievers take this statement from the Quran and claim that the Quran is unscientific, that the sun doesn't set in water, and they laugh at this verse. Of course it's obvious that Allah is telling the story from Dhul Karnayn's perspective and that this verse is not one about science, but one about experience. The word sunset is unscientific anyway, because the sun obviously doesn't set or rise, we just say that because that's how earthlings see the event. The sun is rising and the sun is setting, on sea, in the desert, across the mountains, behind the trees, in murky water. It's just perspective. From Dulkarnain's point of view as a human, he saw the sun setting in murky water. But the thing is, that's not even the point. This verse is not even about the sun. So many people are talking about the sun in this verse and how the sun sets, but we've completely missed the point. This verse is a miracle and is exactly how it should be. It's perfect. Why? Because this verse isn't about science or the science of how the sun sets, or a metaphor about the west of the world. This verse isn't about the sun at all. It's about the murky water. In Arabic, the word used to describe the water is hamia, which translates into murky, foggy or cloudy water. People even say boiling hot water or muddy water. Many Muslims, when talking about the murky water, have some theories about it. Some say it's the Black Sea, and others think it's lava. This is very interesting, but the translation cloudy water, which can also be hot, does also sound like a natural hot spring. All signs so far are indicating not only to somewhere warm, but somewhere very hot. The state of the water is a massive clue to Gog and Magog's location on Earth. If we go with the murky water translation, which seems like lava, or if we go with the cloudy water translation which suggests a hot spring. Lava is obviously found where? Inside a volcano. Well, technically speaking, it's called magma inside the volcano and lava outside the volcano. And hot springs are usually found near volcanoes. 
so Gog and Magog may be near a volcano. So maybe all we really have to do is find the volcano. Allah is leading us on a treasure hunt once again, on a journey. Let's go on an adventure. We're all talking about the wrong thing, the sun, when we should be talking about the cloudy water. Many people have tried to find the wall of Gog and Magog, and Allah knows best, maybe we will never find it. And if we do, we won't be able to break through it. And why on earth would we want to break the wall anyway? Then again, we do have a knack to cause our own destruction. It's obviously a good thing that only Allah can bring down the wall. And maybe that's why it's okay to talk about this topic, because Allah knows we can't bring the wall down anyway. Allah loves it when we ponder, so he gave us a topic to ponder over. The cloudy water. If you read the chapter of the cave, chapter 18 from verse 83 onwards, you will find the story of Dulkarnay. Allah says that this king had a lot of knowledge, and he met three tribes, four if you include Gog and Magog. On this journey, he met the three tribes one after another. Three tribes, three locations. And the third location is where Gog and Magog are. Some say Gog and Magog are two tribes, but it may be more likely that it's just definitions of male and female of the one tribe. The latter is what seems more plausible here, that Gog and Magog are one tribe. The first tribe that Dulkarnain meets is at the first location, somewhere where he can see the cloudy water. Let's really take the Quran literally, like we did with the six days of creation. No metaphors, just simple language. So the sun is setting, which means what? If we take it as simply as possible. It means it's almost nightfall. It doesn't mean the west. It means it's Maghrib. The sun was setting in cloudy water. Then Dulkarnain went on all night until the morning. Maybe he rested with his army because it was night time, and he reached a plain where the sun was rising, indicating it's the next morning. The sun was rising on an area where there was no shade. We are taking it really literally here. It doesn't mean Dulkarnain travelled all the way to the east of the earth. He is still around the same area. It's just the next day. He is just probably some miles away from the first location. This unshaded second location is where he met the second tribe. Then on the same day, because there is no mention of the sun setting or rising, which means it isn't far from the second location. So around the same location, Dulkarnain went on and came across two mountains or barriers. The best translation is actually barriers, like how a dam would look. In Arabic is sad, sadbain is used. So it's not actually mountains. It's more like cliffs, flat on top. This is where Dulkarnain met the final tribe, a very primitive tribe, who were having major problems with an even more primitive tribe, Gog and Magog. And they ask Dulkarnain for help to build a wall, to trap Gog and Magog inside the two barriers. This is where Allah explains in the Quran in a fair amount of detail how the wall was built. Dulkarnain says that he needs iron to build the wall. He says, bring me large lumps of iron. Then he builds the wall made of iron and what it seems like molten copper. Okay, so let's backtrack to the first location for a moment. What is this location? where Dulkarnain can see the sun set in cloudy water. If the cloudy water suggests a hot spring, then the first location is most likely near a volcano. On to the second location, where the sun is rising and there is no shade from it. Allah actually says we had provided no shelter from it. Allah says we, as in the shelter Allah is speaking about is directly from Him. Humans have nothing to do with the shelter, as in its natural shelter trees, shade from mountains, caves, etc. So firstly, this indicates that the first location had natural shade, possibly trees. 
And this second location is barren. Hmm. Somewhere barren near a volcano. Somewhere there's no shade near a volcano. It's all beginning to make sense now, isn't it? Maybe, just maybe, it's the crater or the caldera of the volcano in question. A crater is the bowl shaped mouth of the volcano which forms after a volcanic eruption. A caldera is usually larger and is formed lower underground level. It looks like a crater and has almost vertical walls. Did you know that some craters and calderas are so large that in diameter they are miles and miles wide? The biggest caldera in the world is the Apolaki caldera and is 93 miles in diameter. Most likely this tribe is living inside a caldera and not a crater. Just because a crater is usually created after an outward explosion of a volcano and a caldera is like a collapse of a volcano, a caldera is usually bigger and lower to the ground. There is a hidden question here, a very important question. If the tribe is living inside a caldera or a crater of a volcano, seeing as the tribe actually lived in this shadeless place, the first question should be, can people actually inhabit a volcano? Well, it turns out that people can inhabit a volcano, and they do but is very hard and extremely rare. So then the next question should be, how many inhabited calderas or craters are there on Earth? If you type this question into Google, how many inhabited calderas on Earth, you will find an answer. The answer you will find is Santorini. Santorini, the only caldera on Earth that is inhabited so the place where Dulcarnain travelled must be Santorini? That is, if the theory holds true, but how? It's not much to go on. Santorini doesn't ring any bells at all actually, because the caldera itself is full of water, and it's not murky or cloudy. It's grease. The water is gorgeous. But it is a caldera, so it isn't shaded from the sun. But unless the tribe were mermaids, it doesn't really fit. This is looking like a dead end. I guess that's it for this theory. Wait a minute, that's a caldera. If we dig a little deeper and try to find out how many inhabited craters there are on Earth, we find more answers, but only three more to be exact. There is an island near the Philippines, a Japanese village on Ayogashima Island, which is inside an active volcano. People actually live inside this crater, but it's an island, and it has so many trees and vegetation that it seems it doesn't fit the theory. There's no cloudy or murky water, it's just surrounded by blue sea. This can't be it either. It doesn't seem like Dulcarnain travelled to a small island. The third crater we found is a crater in the island of Fogo in Cape Verde, called Chadas Calderas. There are a few people living there and it's completely barren. But where's the murky cloudy water? It just doesn't fit again. Okay, last one. Last crater. This has to be it, or the theory just needs to be thrown away. This last inhabited crater is in Ecuador. It's called Pululaua. It's actually a caldera, even though it's called Pululaua Crater. It is shadeless, not many trees. And the trees look like they were only planted recently by people, as they are in lines. So it was probably barren before. But again, we don't see any water feature here that fits the bill either. There's no murky or cloudy water. Where did Dulcarnain see the sun setting? Well, we guess this is it then. This also seems like a dead end. But you see, things aren't always as they seem. Sometimes the clue is right there in front of us. You just have to look a little closer. It's just a language problem, as usual. This volcanic caldera 
one of the only four inhabited volcanoes on the planet, is called Pululahua, which translates into cloud of water. Unbelievable, isn't it? A place where there's little to no natural shade. Of course, now it's been cultivated because there's new technology and farming techniques, so there are a few trees here and there. But at the time of Dulkarnain, it was most likely completely barren, so no shade at all. An actual volcanic caldera that's called Cloud of Water, one of the only four inhabited craters or calderas on the planet? Coincidence? What if what is being described in the Quran is not lava, or a hot spring, but literally cloudy water? A cloud of water. Dhul Karnain was looking over the edge of the world, where the sun is setting in a faraway distance, into a massive sea of clouds. Of course, please note, this is a theory. Only Allah knows if this is the location of Gog and Magog. We are merely pondering as Allah wants. So let's continue to discover. Dulkarnain isn't at the caldera. He is yet to go there. When he is with the first tribe looking at the sunset, he would have seen the caldera from a distance. He's not inside the caldera yet, where the second tribe is. Dulkarnain is outside the caldera looking at it it's still quite far away. So when Dulkarnain is inside the caldera, where there's no shade from the sun because it's a huge hole in the ground, and of course clouds are not always there, because clouds always dissipate and form naturally depending on the time and weather. Here, inside this caldera, shade is of course only made by the homes that the people built and live in, if they could build at that time. Then Dulkarnain leaves to find the third location. At the first location, Dulkarnain witnessed the sunset into cloudy water. Then, during sunrise, he arrived at the second location where there was no shade. And now, on to the third location. Two towering cliffs or barriers. This is where Dulkarnain met the third tribe, who were having problems with Gog and Magog. They asked Dulkarnain to build a wall, and Dulkarnain accepts and asks them for help in terms of manpower. He tells the tribe to bring him iron blocks, and then to pour molten copper onto the blocks to form a mold and to solidify the wall. Also to protect the wall from rusting, so it will remain strong. Iron blocks. Are there iron blocks just lying around anywhere and copper can just melt anywhere? For copper or iron to melt, there needs to be a blast furnace or some kind of very hot fire. Did this primitive tribe own a blast furnace? Or did Dulkarnain carry a blast furnace around with him? Of course not. It's the volcano. They used the volcano to do all the work to create the fire, to create the mold, to melt the metal. You know, it is interesting that Dulkarnain didn't ask for the iron blocks to be melted, only the copper. Why is that interesting? Well, because lava is not hot enough to melt iron. But as it turns out, lava is hot enough to melt copper. Another coincidence, once again. Dulkarnain also ordered the people to blow on the metal. Blow? He knew exactly what he was doing. Blowing on the fire would have increased the temperature and making it easier to melt and to mould into shape. Do you know where iron and copper come from? The Earth's crust. Iron comes from iron ore found in the Earth's crust. But originally, iron is from outer space. From stars from a supernova which took place millions of years ago. Iron came to Earth in the form of meteorites, and it's found in the Earth's crust as iron ore. 
Then it goes through a chemical procedure through very high temperatures to become the iron we use for structures. These iron blocks, they are rocks found at the site of the volcano. And the copper? Most of the world's copper is mined from extinct volcanoes. And seeing as technically in the early stages of the Earth, it was actually volcanoes that formed the Earth's crust. And copper is sourced from the Earth. So copper would be found around volcanoes. And to melt the copper? Copper has a lower melting point than iron. So lava is hot enough to melt copper. Here's a thought. Maybe it wasn't molten copper at all, but just molten rock. As in lava. After all, lava does have copper in it. What would happen if lava was poured onto the iron blocks and just left to solidify? If that was the case, this iron wall that we are all searching for, it would just look like a mountain or a cliff with natural rock, invisible to mankind. Please note, wherever this wall is right now, it would most likely be unrecognisable from its original build. So much time has gone by, it would have aged and weathered, and most likely there will be trees or plantation growing on it. People are looking for a metal wall, but it won't look like metal. It will probably look like a normal cliff by now. The Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ states that Gog and Magog dig under the wall every night to try and escape, only to find each morning that the wall has been restored by Allah. Only at the appointed time will Allah allow the wall to collapse, freeing Gog and Magog. Note that the Prophet ﷺ said that they are digging under the wall. This is interesting because they can't dig through a copper-infused iron wall. And they can't go over it because people say that the weather is bad up there. But hold on, aren't Gog and Magog supposed to descend from every mountain top? Weather isn't going to stop them. They can't climb over because Dhulkarnain didn't just build a vertical wall. It's in the Arabic. The two towering barriers are not mountains. They are more like cliffs. The Arabic word used is Saddain, which is derived from the word Sadd, which means dam. So he arrived at the Sadd, the dam-like barriers or cliffs, which we think is the edge of the caldera itself, or somewhere near the edge of the caldera, because isn't a caldera like a natural dam? Many times calderas have other dam-like barriers inside them scattered around the edge, like smaller volcanoes and lava domes. Sometimes the domes aren't just around the edges of the caldera, but in the middle, like Pulalahua. The two towering barriers which acts like a dam could be explained in two scenarios. Both scenarios are to do with perspective. After all, the sun setting in cloudy water was all about perspective. In scenario one, the two towering dam-like barriers could be the edge of the caldera wall, where there is a gap or what we call a lava canyon. Think about it. From a distance, Dulkarnain would see one massive caldera, but from up close, where there is a gap in the towering walls of the caldera, what would he see? If he was between the gap, as in inside the lava canyon, where the lava that escaped from the caldera formed a path, and it's all dried out. Would he not see two towering barriers? Because of the sheer size of the caldera. He built the iron wall in between, and trapped Gog and Magog who were coming out of this path, where the path eventually most likely leads to a cave. A caldera is already underground level, isn't it? And so this lava canyon is underground level, and eventually this path needs to lead somewhere. Either a dead end, or the path continues on cutting through the caldera edge entirely onto an open area, or a cave. Now seeing as Gog and Magog are coming out of a path, it can't be a dead end in the open, because then they can just climb over and we can detect or hear them. And it can't be an open-ended path either, then they can just escape the other way. So logic tells us they come from inside some kind of a cave, where there's no way out but the pathway mentioned in the Quran. You know, I've always wondered why the story of Dhulkarnay is in the chapter of the what? 
the chapter of the cave. Because just like the people of the cave, Gog and Magog are also inside a cave, underground, where many years have gone by and they are still alive, and our satellites can't see them or detect them. So the surface of the cliffs are at ground level. Dulkarnain would be building the wall below ground level. And then he asked to refill the gap, the canyon. The second scenario is pretty much similar to the first scenario, but on a slightly smaller scale. The two towering barriers which acts like a dam could be one volcano, where one side of it had collapsed due to lava flow after an eruption. For example, like Mount St. Helens. And this volcano is inside the massive caldera itself. From a distant perspective, this one volcano is seen as one towering dam-like barrier. But we human beings are small. And again, from a very close perspective, if Dulkarnain was right at the path that the lava from a volcano had created, and it's all dried out, from this perspective, he would again see two towering barriers leading to a crater. And this smaller volcanic crater needed to be built up like a dam and then refilled. And maybe Dulkarnain filled up the crater to block off Gog and Magog, who were coming out from inside this smaller volcanic crater. With all the manpower he had, after all he had an army and the tribe at his disposal, it is possible to fill a crater with all that manpower. Volcanoes have a smaller hole inside the crater where the lava flows out from inside the Earth's crust. And maybe that's where Gog and Magog come out from. From inside a sleeping volcano. From inside a cavity in the ground. So, from inside a cave. And again, this would mean that they are coming out from below ground level. And after filling the crater, it looks like a lava dome, which was once a volcano. Lava domes, after all, act like volcanoes. They are protrusions formed from lava. They just have lava that is thicker than inside a volcano. But lava domes, they can also erupt, just maybe not as violently. Why do we say all this? Well, the clue is in the Arabic. Instead of just building the wall up like a dam, which is sud in Arabic, Dulkarnain used the word radam after saying he came across the dams, saddain. Radam means to backfill or refill. Isn't that interesting? To suggest that maybe the path that is there at the dams wasn't always there and they need to refill it. Radam sounds like a lava path out of a volcanic crater, doesn't it? Dulkarnain filled the path up completely like you would fill a hole. This sounds like the vent of a volcano, a basin of some sort that got filled up and not just filled up, but refilled, because it was once intact, like before a volcanic eruption. And yes, this would be like a dam, because a volcano acts like a dam, doesn't it? And guess what a crater or a caldera that acts like a dam is called? A lava dam. Isn't that fascinating? The wording used inside the Quran. So the path out of the crater is all closed off with the iron blocks and molten copper or, like we suggested before, maybe it was lava that was poured onto the iron. There's no hole to be seen anymore. Gog and Magog are completely imprisoned inside. What sounds like either a hollow part of a volcano, which would now probably look like a lava dome, or they are locked behind the side of the caldera itself, where there's possibly a cave that needed to be blocked off and refilled. And after, it would just look like the caldera wall. So of course they are digging under the wall, because the ground is softer to dig through. And to dig up through solid rock is impossible, because rock is always tougher at surface level. And to dig through iron is just not going to happen. They are surrounded by deep rock, and they know the way out is behind the iron wall. Their only way out is to dig under the wall. And every night when they are told to stop digging and start again the next morning, each night the hole that they dug gets restored. 
Maybe Gog and Magog are inside one of the several lava domes inside or surrounding Pululahua Caldera. Only Allah knows. Now let's think. Remember, Allah created the laws of physics. They are His laws. He is using them and everything natural or supernatural belongs to Him. Allah actually does these things in all His wisdom and is letting nature take its course. Not because He needs to. It's because Allah is all wise and He wants us to relate to how things work in the universe so that we may be in awe of it all. Of course, it can be a miracle. Allah can do all things. Miracles are an exception to the laws of physics. Miracles do not abide by the laws of physics. Miracles are direct acts of Allah. And note, just because the laws of the universe cannot explain what a miracle is on this universe, it doesn't mean that the miracles we hear about or see in this universe isn't just part of the normal laws of physics in another universe. Like Jesus, peace be upon him, walking on water for example, that's probably completely normal in another universe with different laws of physics. Anyway, back to the wall. This hole that Gog and Magog dig under the iron wall, it seems would obey the laws of physics of this universe, the first heaven. So it is being restored naturally. When the Prophet ﷺ said in an authentic hadith that Gog and Magog dig every day until they can see the rays of the sun, and then one of them tells the others to go back and we'll dig tomorrow. Now think for a moment. Why on earth would even the most primitive species stop digging at that point, when they can see the sun rays? They'd want to escape desperately. But maybe it's not sunlight they are seeing, but something else that looks like sunlight. But it's something dangerous for them so they have to stop. Lava does have a glow, doesn't it? Did you know that when lava flows, the surface that gets exposed to air can dry in as quickly as 15 to 20 minutes? There are about 12 lava domes in Pululawua. If Gog and Magog are inside one of them, if they are digging, whatever they dig, could it be possible that every night this hole gets filled with lava and as it cools it solidifies? It solidifies enough that when Gog and Magog wake up the next morning to start digging, they have to start all over again. And the reason they keep stopping the dig when one of them says, let's begin again tomorrow, maybe the reason is that something is stopping them from digging further, magma. Magma is the molten rock found under the Earth's crust, and when it reaches the Earth's surface, it is then called lava. So they dig and dig under. They dig the solidified magma until eventually reaching this extremely hot molten rock underneath each night. Which means they have to stop. Then when they return the hole has been filled again and hardened. And one day, when one of them says inshallah, in whatever language they do speak, the magma won't be there. And that's the day Allah allows them to be released. Maybe that's the day when the magma escapes as lava. Only Allah knows. There was a time when the Prophet ﷺ was terrified and claimed that Gog and Magog have managed to dig a tiny hole through the wall. How is this possible if there is lava blocking their path? We don't really know for sure of course. This tiny hole is as small as when we put our index fingertip to our thumb tip. It is possible that Gog and Magog have managed to dig a tiny hole below the iron wall and above the lava chamber, but it's too small for them to do anything about, or they have actually dug a tiny hole through the metal wall. Maybe they found a weak spot in the metal. Just some things to think about. So, how will they be released? Well, what are the other major signs? Three of the other major signs of the hour are earthquakes. Seeing as they are signs of the end of the world, we can guess that these three earthquakes are going to be pretty high on the Richter scale. Mega quakes. One in the west, one in the east, and one in the Arabian Peninsula. This volcanic caldera is in Ecuador. Ecuador is in the northern, southern, and in the western hemisphere. How? because it's right bang in the middle of the equator. Hence its name, Ecuador. 
Allah usually allows nature to take course, like the six days. Allah allows 13.8 billion years to go by for the universes to form naturally in all his wisdom. So when the wall of Gog and Magog is supposed to come down, some people say that this will be a miracle. But usually, when Allah says something is a miracle, he uses the word wonder, or the event in question is usually too much of the ordinary. Anyway, a wall coming down, as huge as it is, it doesn't have to be outside the laws of physics. But of course, only Allah knows. We are merely pondering. If the ten major signs occur like beads falling off a necklace, they must all be connected somehow, right? Now we know that the Dajjal, the beast and the sun rising from the west are connected together as mentioned in the previous episode, the lost island of Dajjal. And of course Isa Salam is connected to the Dajjal, seeing as he is the one that kills the Dajjal. And Jesus' coming is directly linked to that event. Right now Jesus, peace be upon him, is in the second universe, 500 light years away from us. He is close. Why? Because he is to return, of course. No point of him being all the way up in the seventh universe with Ibrahim salam, is it? It all makes sense. Where Isa salam, is right now, time is going much slower for him, relative to the earth. So when he left earth 2000 years ago, that's 2000 years in earth time. For him, he probably just left minutes ago. And then he saw the Prophet salam, on the night journey and he told the Prophet salam, that he is going to return. And when Jesus does return, he would not have aged a day. Why? Time dilation. He will come down with two angels carrying him down. I wonder what that would look like. Teleportation? Like Jesus, peace be upon him, is being beamed down. Also note that when the Dajjal sees Isa Islam, he runs away immediately and starts to melt, which is again teleportation. But this is even more proof that the Dajjal travelled back to the past from the future. Think about it. No one actually knows what Jesus peace be upon him looks like. All the images we see of Jesus peace be upon him, they are not real depictions of him. The Dajjal runs away immediately after seeing Jesus? How does he know what Jesus looks like? Isn't it obvious that the Dajjal has seen Jesus peace be upon him before? Probably not from the time of Jesus 2000 years ago because the Dajjal gets trapped on the island before he can arrive at Jesus' time. But he knows what Jesus looks like because after the return of Christ there would probably be a lot of photos and real images of Jesus from the future. From people taking images. There's probably a lot of documentation of what Jesus really looks like in the end times. Where the Dajjal is from. The dots are looking more and more connected now, aren't they? The Dajjal, the beast and the sunrise are all linked to the flip of the magnetic field. What if the flip of the Earth's magnetic field causes even more damage? What if it triggers the three earthquakes? And what if one of the earthquakes levels the wall of Yajuj and Majuj? And what if the earthquake and the collapse of the wall coincides with the lava that's blocking the way for Gog and Magog to dig out because the lava escapes out after the earthquake. The mega quake in the west. This devastating quake could release the lava blocking the way for Gog and Magog to get out. But as the lava escapes out onto the earth, there's no need to dig any further because the earthquake would cause the wall to collapse anyway unleashing the most vile species ever known to mankind in its trillions. They swarm from every mountain top, consuming absolutely anything and everything in their path, drinking all the water from the lake of Tabaria. Meanwhile, Isa salam and the believers are hiding inside a cave in the mountains, waiting for the horror to end. Gog and Magog think that they have wiped out all life on earth, so now they point their arrows to the sky and shoot. The arrows return with blood on them. Some think that these arrows are missiles, and they shoot planes out of the sky. It's probable. But bear in mind, it's the end times, and the tech that remains would be few and belonging to the deceased Dajjal, who's soon to be born, if not already. The flip 
of the Earth's magnetic field would have most likely caused a massive EMP affecting the whole planet. But of course, the Jarl knew this would happen anyway seeing as he's from the future. He would probably protect all his technology in the past. And therefore, when the Dajjal emerges, when the grid is down, he will have free energy to restart the fallen civilization of Earth, where mankind will literally flock to him. The Dajjal will have the only real technology left. But of course there will be a few others who had protected their tech using small Faraday boxes or cages. People do that now, just in case. And it's a pretty good idea considering what's coming. Our guess is that the Dajjal and his slaves already have a bigger version of the Faraday cage, where no EMP can damage what's inside, so it's most likely not missiles. We will in fact go back to the Stone Age after the magnetic reversal. Therefore most likely it's actually just regular arrows, and Gog and Mogog are so primitive, how are they going to shoot missiles anyway even if there was tech left? The arrows come down smeared in blood, we don't really know what's happening here, there are so many of these creatures, therefore so many arrows. Trillions of arrows in fact if the majority of Gog and Magog have arrows. And if they are all set off, these arrows are bound to hit birds. Actual birds, not planes, flying in the sky. But of course, Allah knows best. We don't really know. And there's not much evidence. Thereafter, Gog and Magog will be taken out by what seems like some kind of virus a small worm in their necks, and they will all die as one entity, all at once. The largest population on the planet, defeated by the smallest of creatures. A believer comes out of the cave to check if Gog and Magog are still alive. He will see the whole tribe of Gog and Magog on the ground, dead. The followers of Isa a.s. come out onto what remains of earth. Allah sends birds and rain to clear the stench and the bodies of the deceased. Peace fills the earth, the calm before the storm. Now all this, of course, we really don't know if Gog and Magog are in Ecuador or not. Only Allah knows, this is just a theory. All our information is pointing towards this area on Earth. The cloud of water, the caldera, just had to have this name. Inside one of the only four inhabited volcanoes in the world, where there is no natural shade from the sun, where the edges of the caldera would act like a dam, the lava domes filled with lava, where of course, there is a volcano where Dulcarnane would have used to melt metal. There are a lot of coincidences in this list. You know, there is one more lingering thought about all this. Something else that we discovered by the will of Allah. Dulcarnane is said to have journeyed to the ends of the earth, right? When he met the people of Gog and Magog, well, that statement literally would make sense if the Earth was flat. But the Earth is not flat, it's round. And we know this, and that's why people say that Gog and Magog may be in the North Pole somewhere because that's the furthest place on Earth. Again, this sounds like a flat Earth theory. The North Pole isn't the edge of the Earth, because the Earth is not flat. What if we look at this statement that Dulcarnane travelled to the ends of the Earth in a different way? If you look at Ecuador on the world map, Ecuador sits on the edge of South America, at the edge of the land, where you can't go any further, just as Dulcarnane described. Isn't that interesting? Not interesting enough though, is it? Well, why would it be? There are many countries next to the ocean and all could be considered as the edge of the earth. Well, yes, but Ecuador is one of the only four with a volcano people actually live inside, so that's something to go on but it's still not enough evidence. Okay, fine. But hang on a minute. Maybe we are looking at it the wrong way around. Ecuador is called Ecuador because it's on the equator, right? And the equator is the part of our round Earth that bulges out a bit compared to the rest of the Earth. This actually makes Ecuador the highest country in the world. 
because of Earth's bulge. So high that Mount Chimborazo in Ecuador is actually 1.5 miles higher than Mount Everest. Is it so hard to believe? We know what this means, right? This means that Ecuador is literally on the edge of the world. That makes Ecuador the closest country to space.